Zealand. That was fantastic. Um, and, and, and absolutely fascinating to, to obviously analog management over here, seeing you know, the, the new digital world actually taking such a, an established idea and, and really kind of putting it through its paces. I mean, how much more opportunity, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating too that broadly, if I understood what you've just said, it, it holds up. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, does the, the interesting thing about these digital platforms are they are at once um, an uh, opportunity to study human relationships, economic relationships, how economies evolve, but they're also their own socio-technical systems. So we are designers of them, we are students of them, and we are participants in them. And so these algorithms being so powerful uh, means that we have a responsibility to understand them, how they shape the digital economy, how they shape digital society. And if you replace this employment algorithm with a newsfeed algorithm or other types of algorithms, now we're talking not just about employment and economic outcomes, but we're talking about voting and whether or not we take a vaccine and everything else in society. And now we realize, wow, this is pretty important in terms of how we manage these systems, how we think about new management theories for guiding human beings in this new socio-technical environment. Mm. So, so I took away that, that you know, I, I, I felt a wave of optimism and hope <laughs> as you were speaking. But I mean, the problem is that, you know, we, 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 as with we, some of the conversations earlier in the day, we, you know, we've seen how algorithms can also be weaponized. And it, it's, you know, how, how, do we, how do we wrestle control back? I mean, you would say that, but you are sort of saying, let the scientists, let the, let the, uh, the, 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 the researchers sort of have a bit more um, control. Because at the moment, it, unfortunately, a lot of the algorithms are in the, under the control of you know, um, other economic forces. Um, Absolutely. <coughs> I mean, I think this is one of the most important questions of today and one of the most yeah. important questions of our day, if yeah, you will, no, broadly speaking. What do I mean by that? I mean, this study is an existence proof for the ability to study, understand, and thus design algorithms to do things we want them to do, like ameliorate inequality, or maximize welfare, or increase economic opportunity, or have humanity recover from pandemic-based devastating unemployment faster than we could if we didn't design algorithms correctly. It shows that it can be done. But it could be, it's also health, it's it, welfare, it's, it's I mean, all those you, things. You can roll oh, it out. Welfare. You know, spreading information that creates incentives for vaccinations and then gets people vaccinated faster and thus mm -hmm. avoids the pandemic lasting longer, people dying. We're talking about lives, we're talking about economic, you know, realities. <clears throat> but what you describe <clears throat> is super important, which is. The economic incentives for the designers and the people who run the platforms, the tremendous opacity of these platforms. So we have really very little idea how these algorithms work. We don't have access as a public, as scientists. There aren't laws about transparency. We have whistleblowers like Francis Haugen who has to sort of go out on a limb to provide information about what's going on sort of behind the curtain, if you will, of these algorithms. And that's just not conducive to being able to understand and design these algorithms to achieve the outcomes we want to achieve as a society. It is conducive more to the profit maximization that we see. And we saw in multiple panels today this idea that the profit maximization creates, for example, a desire to maximize engagement. Why? Because the platforms run currently on an advertising model. So that engagement is correlated with profits and revenue. And that engagement, what does that push us towards? It pushes us towards extreme views, pushes us towards hyperbole, pushes us towards polarization. Uh, and so this is all part and parcel of crucial societal questions about not only how do you design the algorithms, but how do you set up the societal incentives to create uh, incentives for those algorithms to be designed and examined properly under a transparent framework, which I think we've got a lot of work to do.
Yeah, no, I, I, I see what you're saying. Listen, I, there's some questions come in. Um, we, we will come back to the, the, the big themes of the day, yeah. but I'm, I'm duty bound to put these questions. I yeah. promised I would, I would take as many questions as I could and put as many questions as I could. Perfect. So question, how might the metaverse, Web3 or AI, be impactful to the notion of weak ties? And then this is sort of second thought, I think I know where they're coming from. Just another cluster, structural hole filler, or maybe even a mechanism to optimize, maximize those weak tires. Yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, if you think about, uh, take the metaverse first, um, you can imagine that as a virtual, some sort of virtual reality environment in which we are uh, socializing. Um, partly we're going to enter into different metaverses and we're going to socialize there in groups. We're going to form some relationships in those groups that are individual. So I might go to a metaverse experience, meet some people, and have certain people that I really connect with and become friends with. In that sort of interpersonal way, you're going to have a similar unfolding, I think, of strong and weak ties. But you're also going to have these sort of, in a physics term, multiverses, where you have you know, one metaverse and another metaverse and another metaverse, and an individual can be parts of multiple of them. So it might add some layering. It's kind of like institutional affiliation, right? So I have some set of friendships that happen at work. I have some set of friendships that happen through my, say, local community. I have some set of friendships that happen through my cultural community or heritage. You might have similar layering of different metaverses. Um, but I think largely human beings socialize in a way that's going to continue to replicate the ways that social networks have evolved to date. Okay, um, another, another question. Fascinating study, indeed, can't argue with that. And then the question is, it's, it's like the, the power of the, the magic number three. Is triad the only unit possible, or can it be a quad? Yes, yeah, so, also, yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic question. Um, there are different studies of, for example, quads or cliques and, and growing numbers of, of K clusters, where K is either three or four or five or however many. Um, there is some really interesting work happening uh, here at MIT in the Institute for Data Systems and Society on a doctoral thesis um, that I am uh, part of the, the thesis committee for that is examining sort of flows across higher orders of groups. So how does information flow across sort of groups that aren't individuals, but uh, we can think of them as um, communities, if you will. That's the best sort of nomenclature I can use. Um, you know, you might have a group that meets weekly of five people, and another group of four people that meets weekly, and another group of seven people. Well, how can we consider those as relationships where the relationship is the community of those people uh, you know, um, persisting in a sense, and then, you know, temporarily dissolving, then persisting, then dissolving, persisting. If we think about it that way, we can find uh, new ways of thinking about information flow, and it's turning out that this new way of thinking about it is uh, sometimes more accurately predictive of how information act actually flows, and so I'm really excited about the possibilities of new forms of measurement. I think this is very novel, and uh, I'm actually thinking about working with LinkedIn and this student and other advisors to try to um, test this new theory out about how information may flow in groups of people rather than just one to one to one to one. Mm. You know, it's not, it's great to think of. You know, uh, we, we've 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 possibly given possibly given the, some of these um, social um, sort of network platforms a bit of a bad PR today, but I mean, deservedly, I think in most cases, but it's nice to think that LinkedIn, you're, you're garnering useful, potentially positive um, information, data. And, and that sort of, as you were talking, it, it occurred to me that we probably have, in, in, or you have, as, the, as digital researchers, an abundance of data now. Is that gonna change the research sort of cycle in terms of how fast, because there's always been a tension in, in, old, in old school management, there, were, there was always a tension between, if you like, rigor and relevance. By the time the academics had done the research and collected and made, written their papers, 
you could question the relevance of it. So we are, we, one, of the, one of the great challenges, we are forever trying to see the future in the rearview mirror. You know, it's that classic problem. Is there an opportunity here because of the sort of sheer quantity of data and the processing power Absolutely. we now have to accelerate that? So, I mean, I, and I also take the point that, you know, you can't rush good research. So. Yes. I think the answer is yes. So I think the processing power, the storage power, the access to large data sets um, is really important. I also think the ability to quickly run very large scale experiments is very important. So we actually have been for, I think now, going on 10 years next year, running uh, one of the premier conferences called the Conference on Digital Experimentation here at MIT, which is an industry academic uh, conference that looks at the cutting edge of digital experimentation. The thing about experiments is they are the gold standard for causal inference. So they're the gold standard for getting a cause and effect. There's a reason why you can't put a new drug on the market without randomized controlled trials because that's what we know what the effects of that are going to be. And so the ability to run these very large experiments very quickly uh, certainly speeds up the time to new discoveries in terms of social science, economics, and science. Well, we saw it with the vaccines to some extent. We, That's the, the, that was, zoom, you know, the exactly. way it was accelerated. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it also allows us to answer questions that were previously unanswerable because now we have such high fidelity of data, such ability to ask and answer experimental questions that were really intractable without the digital platforms and the scale that they have. So. On all fronts, I think it's an, a, a really exciting time to be a scientist mm -hmm. and also a really exciting time uh, for humanity. The question, as today has always come back to, is will we take advantage of this? Will we privilege the right incentives? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, I, and the, the enduring image that, that is, is the one that Martin Lindstrom brought of the, of the little Korean girl and, yes. and the question you know, that, that I'm going to be thinking about for, for days now is, you know, who will own that avatar of that child? And to what extent, you know, are we, I think, I think again, Martin made the same point that, that we, it's a shame we didn't do more experimentation before we kind of let the genie out of the bottle and we just went, oh, okay, let's do, you know, let's, let's have social media and just let it do what it does. It would be nice to think that we might, we might be a bit more, um, forward thinking on the front foot with I really um, hope I really hope we can be I do think that those two points that that he made are really evocative and you know terrifying to a large extent if you if you bring it more to a a literally this week and last week ubiquitous trend which is this notion of sort of commoditizing identity cues on social media so these blue check marks that are now being yeah. sold yeah on Twitter and Facebook, we actually did have the opportunity to, to do a large scale two year study of those check marks. And frighteningly, what we found was that the existence of identity cues leads to more knee jerk opinion formation because we take the cue rather than the substance of what, what's being said as the important thing, who's saying it. We focus on who's saying it rather than what's being said more in-group, out-group dynamics, and more, quote unquote, rich get richer dynamics, which means that reputation begets reputation, and we forget about evaluating the substance of the things that are being said, and we focus on just making opinions and decisions based on who's got the blue check mark. And now those blue check marks are for sale, which means that anyone can buy them. It's not about verifying the expertise or identity of the individual, but just who's willing to pay eight or 12 bucks a month and suddenly that's the new currency for persuasion online. Wow, that is a huge change with dramatic implications for how human beings decide about everything from whether I believe the vaccine science to whether I vote for this political candidate or whether I vote at all in the next election. Okay, well, let's go back to the hopeful side. Yes. Let's, let's, end, <laughs> let's end on a positive. Um, I mean, I, 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 obviously, Martin being Martin was, was, was not so hopeful. But are you optimistic about the future? I am. I am generally an optimist. Uh, I do believe, as you and I have had this conversation, uh, in the promise and the peril of technology. So technology uh, is not in and of itself value-laden. It's imbued with values based on how human beings use it. So I think that uh, what that front 
uh, runs for me or what highlights for me is are the extreme amount of responsibility we have in this new era to really think about the consequences of our design choices, of our advocacy, of our science, and so on. I do believe at the end of the day uh, in the fundamental sort of goodness of human nature, and that's a choice in, in essence. And so I think that those better angels of our nature uh, will, should and will sort of come to the fore and really drive us uh, towards a more positive society. I'm hopeful. Well, I'm going to I'm going to I leave it there. I think let's let's stay let's let's finish with the angels and and the human nature being being, you know, the positive side of human nature. So and that's been absolutely fantastic. We've had I can't I can only say from point of view of Thinkers 50 it's been an absolute fantastic day. It's been it's been a real privilege and a great honor to be here and um, I think we've, we've had some fabulous conversations. I feel the same exact way. Uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store with these conversations because I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the things that I learn sort of minute to minute to, to minute hearing these amazing thinkers uh, you know, talk to each other and exchange ideas. One thing to point out is that this idea of, of curating different types of people and different viewpoints was so critical to today mm -hmm. and so critical to what we do in the future, like having an economist with a cultural anthropologist with you know, a branding expert together thinking and you moderating that conversation, that blew me away. So I was really, really jazzed about the possibilities of today of this collaboration of these types of curation. I think it's only by bringing the different people together and the different points of view that we, we are going to make this sort of progress. So, so yeah. thank you for letting us um, thank curate you. some of this. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you for sending in your questions, for staying with us, for tuning in. And um, I hope you can join us again for something similar very, very soon.